Hello everyone, my name is Emily Artful and this is my Halloween Spooktacular Artathon. This Halloween season, I decided to undertake three unique artistic endeavors and I would like to share my process with you. To kick us off, the other day when I was returning home with my two sons coming up our front stairs, my oldest son stopped me and said, look what I found, I think it's a skeleton. I figured he may have just found a bone or a cicada shell and the excitement of Halloween caused him to exaggerate a little bit. But when I got a closer look, it was a perfectly preserved bird skull and it was so delicate, perfectly preserved in earth. I've always taught my sons to look down when you take a walk because you never know what kind of treasures you'll find. And this was a perfect example of a wonderful treasure. So follow along while I attempt to paint a delicate little design on this delicate little bird skull. Boop! I knew painting the bird skull was going to be quite a challenge. It was just an itty bitty whittle thing, weighing in at only 0 .008 ounces. It was only one and a quarter inch long from the back of the skull to the tip of its beak, and only three quarters of an inch wide when measured from the widest parts of the skull on either side. Teeny tiny. And to think birds can get even smaller than this. I've only ever seen mega chonky birds in my yard, but I have to remind myself that all that chonk is mostly <laughs> plumage. Anyway, I obviously had to start off by cleaning the dirt and debris from the skull, but I had to use an incredibly delicate process to do this. I started off with two separate cups, one with just plain warm water, and another with a mixture of gentle dish soap, a small amount of 90% isopropyl alcohol, and warm water. I used a very low snap paintbrush to get inside of the skull and loosen some of the larger chunks of debris. I had a friend recommend using a toothbrush, but this skull was so incredibly brittle that even the softest bristled toothbrush might have been too aggressive. This area of bone is so incredibly delicate that I knew cleaning around it with any kind of pressure would surely snap it off completely. It is true that bird bones are more flexible than our bones, but they're also infinitely more delicate because they lack density, enabling the bird to fly. Okay, the osteoornithology class is now dismissed. It's kind of funny, sometimes when people ask, oh, what kind of art do you make? I say, osteo art, <laughs> and they're like, oh, like in textbooks? And then I'm just like, no, just to be weird. Anyway, the paintbrush was a good tool for removing the chunks of gunk, but after a certain point, it became useless to the more stubborn chunks Oh gunk. So I had to switch to something only slightly more aggressive. Because I've watched far too many videos from Baumgartner Restoration, I decided to whip out some cotton and tweezers and get to dabbing. That helped to get the last few larger chunks out, but there were a few areas that none of my tools could reach, so I used a spray bottle on its straight stream setting to gently spray into the skull and flush out any remaining gunky chunks. All of this talk of gunky chunks is probably making you super hungry, she he said sarcastically. After the last rinse, I used my remaining cotton to dab the skull dry in order to prep it for Daniel Smith's watercolor ground. Now I won't be using actual watercolors for the majority of this design, but I needed a ground medium that was more absorbent than gesso. Gesso is an ideal base for acrylic paints, but acrylic paints are far too thick for this tiny canvas, and even though they can be watered down, the paint loses its integrity the more water you add to it, running the risk of cracking in the future. Instead, I decided to use acrylic gouache as my medium of choice here. Acrylic gouache is basically the secret love child of water watercolors and acrylic paint, and I'm all here for it. I was able to water down the paint to a nice, thin consistency while still keeping the paint's integrity intact. Not only that, but acrylic gouache cannot be reactivated once it sets, so once done and dry, my design can be sealed onto the skull without mixing into the sealant. This is why I chose a watercolor medium to lay down as a base, because it has the perfect absorbency for this thin, watered-down consistency of paint. I wanted to keep the design simple, but I also wanted to make it appear intricate. 
so I decided to play it safe and go with swirling vines with small buds and florals. Instead of creating a totally flat color design, which would have been easiest, I mixed up multiple shades of each color as I would with a normal, larger painting. This just helps to add more dimension to the piece, even if it's incredibly subtle. This is what will make the design appear more intricate at first glance. A dot here, a stripe there will add the illusion of more detailed depth. When I was first coming up with designs, I developed a very important rule of thumb. I would ask myself, would this design look good as a head tattoo on a bald person? And if it wouldn't, I would scrap the idea. I feel like if Rihanna went totally bald and she would look fucking amazing, she'd slay. This would be the type of head tattoo she'd get. Maybe she could even like find a way to integrate it and do her iconic back of the neck stars tattoo. Like somehow integrate the stars into the vines. Oh my God, that would look amazing. But fucking anything would look amazing on our queen Rihanna, we stand. Something else I had to keep in mind when I started the painting process was the timing of my caffeine consumption. I have a cup of coffee every morning and there is a not so sweet spot at both the start and the end of the caffeine buzz where my hands shake just a little bit for a very short amount of time. I can mitigate this bit of shakiness by drinking my coffee slower and a little bit earlier in the morning. Basically, I had to time release the caffeine into my system at a much slower rate than normal. Because normally I'm up, the coffee goes into the coffee face hole as quickly as possible, then I'm zoomy zoomy around, cooking breakfast, dressing children, unloading the dishwasher, trying to shove some food into the coffee face hole, then getting children out the door and into the car without any small child related drama. So I had to work around all of that to make sure I was awake enough to herd my children around like the little chubby sheep babies that they are, but not so awake that by the time I got home, I was a vibrating ball of mom stress. You'd think for my own sanity, I would try to just drink my coffee be slower every day, but some days we just gotta put our pedal to the metal, go balls to the walls, blast our cooters like hoovers. Some days a mom's just gotta go hard, so she needs to soak up every last second of precious sleep that she can and then shove caffeine into her body. What can I say? Moms, dads, guardians, parents, like, we, we go hard in the morning. As per usual, I had a lot of fun doing this. It was a challenge, but not so much of a challenge that it drained the fun out of the activity. Once I had completed the design, I grabbed my glitter watercolors and painted on a glittery gold beak for some extra flair. And I didn't film this next part, but I sealed the skull with Rust-Oleum's glossy clear coat. But be careful when spraying because the force from the sprayer will blast your tiny packing peanut sized skull away. I learned that the hard way and had to pick bits of dirt off the first layer of clear coat because obviously I did my spraying outside and I blew my little tiny skull into my garden. <laughs> Whoops. I hope you guys enjoyed the process of this first artistic endeavor from my Halloween spooptacular artathon. Thank you guys so much for watching and don't forget to stay out of trouble and stay spooky. See you ghouls later.